Greetings, everybody. Welcome in to Mining Stock Daily. This is this week's long-form episode, and it is really constructive and pretty long, actually, because it's two segments. First, we welcome in Barry Knapp of Ironside Macro. He, Barry is pretty well known amongst the investment and finance community, does a lot of TV appearances. I was able to meet him a few weeks ago at another conference, and I welcomed him on to this episode to talk big picture what is happening in the bond and treasury markets right now. And he's got a lot of thoughts and a lot to say about not only the supply of treasuries coming online, but when might the Fed, Fed actually start cutting rates? So important conversation with Barry. Hope you pay attention. And then we go back to a returning guest. We welcome back in Michael Oliver of Momentum Structural Analysis. And that is a great conversation talking about where he's seeing momentum uh, really strengthen and also wane. What is happening in the big markets? What's happening in precious metals? And we get a little philosophical with Mike, as we typically do with him in all of our conversations. So long, long episode, important episode, because this is really going to kick off three weeks of a lot of corporate updates in three different uh, uh, conferences in Europe, plus a lot of big macro uh, conversations I'm scheduled to have during those times while I'm away reporting uh, from Zurich, reporting from Frankfurt, and also reporting from London. So this is really going to kick off a very, very busy month for Mining Stock Daily. I hope you hit that like, subscribe, share with your friends, all of those things, because this winter we are going to uh, put an end to 2023 as best as we can. Very busy. All right, special thank you to Western Copper and Gold. Special thank you to Fireweed Metals. And special thank you to Arizona Sonoran Copper for their continued support of the podcast throughout the year. All right, everybody, here we go. Let's start things off with Barry Knapp and then into my conversation with Michael Oliver. Have a wonderful weekend and be well. All right, you're back here on Mining Stock Daily, introducing a new guest to the listeners and viewers here on our YouTube channel. Happy to welcome in Ironside Macroeconomics Barry Knapp. Uh, Barry is no stranger to markets. He's got a long career. Uh, he now writes an incredible substack called Ironside Macro. And we, I was first met Barry uh, in Beaver Creek at the MI2's Global Macro Summit. And uh, him and I had some really great conversations and kicked things off. Turns out he still roots for the uh, the best uh, team in London, uh, football team as well. So obviously we had a few things to talk about. But uh, Barry, uh, pleasure to have you on here on the podcast. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I, we, I, I promise you, I'm not going to ask you about mining stocks, but I do want to spend some time asking you about things that you're watching currently. Listen, there's a huge treasury auction, a couple of huge treasury auctions this week. <laughs> this treasury yield curve right now is all over the place. It's hard to make sense of. Uh, but, you know, give us a sense of just kind of the dynamics of things you're really paying attention to. Sure. I, I think there's three big issues at hand. One is the three-month bear st steepening we've seen in the yield curve that <clears throat> reversed to a great extent last week, but um, remains an ongoing issue, and we definitely should dig in on that issue. Um, there's the broader trajectory for the economy. We had this incredibly robust uh, third quarter GDP, which I suspect is way overstated in terms of consumption and can dig in on that a little bit. Um, the, in essence, the BEA doesn't have any really good information on services consumption until 50 days after the end of the quarter. So I suspect we're going to see a fairly substantial downward revision to consumption driven by services consumption. And <clears throat> I've been arguing throughout the course of the year that the labor market is much weaker than the headline payroll gains would imply for a number of reasons. But first and foremost, the fact that the price is coming down, right? So wage growth mm -hmm. has been decelerating throughout the course of the year. That couldn't possibly happen if demand for labor was as strong as those headline payroll gains, at least before revisions. And we've had eight of, or nine of 10 months have been negative revisions. 
but as strong as those implied. And so there's the trajectory of the economy. And then from an equity market perspective, we just ended the earnings recession this quarter with some 80% of the S&P 500 having reported. But the forward revisions, you know, net revisions is the ISM of, of earnings analyst estimates. It's a number of analysts increasing estimates, less those decreasing estimates. And that bottomed last November and was a catalyst for the market rallying throughout, or one of the catalysts throughout most of the year, in particular in tech and tech and related sectors. But those revisions have rolled over hard, which mm -hmm. may very well be connected to, you know, question number two, which is the trajectory for the economy. So those three things for me are the uh, big ongoing issues. But let's start with the broader question of the yield curve and this bear steepening we, we've had over the last three months. Um, there were three potential scenarios to disinvert the yield curve. And make no mistake, I believe the yield curve needs to be disinverted in the first half of 2024. If not, we're going to have a real credit problem. We have a big mm. issue with multifamily real estate projects under construction that will be completed in 24 and some in 25 that will need to be refinanced into multifamily real estate loans. Construction loans get done as, you know, two to three year term loans at a fixed rate. Those were initiated when rent growth was 15% and the base rate was zero. Well, now rent growth is negative, at least for new rents by 1% or so. And the base rate's up 500 basis points. So a lot of those projects are not feasible any longer and they will need to be refinanced. Without an upward sloping yield curve, the bank banking system can't do a couple things. They can't refinance that, but they also can't help finance the government. And I'm going to come back to that important point <laughs> as well. So curve needs to disinvert by the first half of 2024. There's three ways to get there. There's bull steepeners, which could happen for one of two reasons. One is inflation falls and the Fed decides to cut rates. That's the path we were on for most of the year until the very end of July, beginning of August, um, when the Fed, in essence, kind of gave up on that idea and said, no, we need growth to weaken in order for inflation to continue lower and stay down, which was kind of curious. They seem to be backing away from that uh, more recently in the partial pivot speeches before the FOMC and then the FOMC meeting. There's then the bull steepener based upon the economy really weakening and the Fed cutting as a consequence of that, which is we're likely to get some form of that in the first half. And then there's the most insidious way for the curve to disinvert, which was the bear steepener. And that's what we went through over the course of the last three months. Now, in my 39 years, and maybe I'm misremembering some of the Bon Vigilante stuff in the early <laughs> 90s, but I really only recall two periods where the curve really moved, the long end of the curve really moved to, to absorb and reprice supply. And the first one was from January 4th, 2021, when the Republicans lost both of those special elections in Georgia, lost the Senate, and we went from expecting no new stimulus to getting $1.9 trillion. Um, you had a 60 basis point move in 30-year real rates, which is the part of the curve least impacted by <clears throat> either the Fed's balance sheet or rate policy. But then the Treasury completely cut issuance. And by the way, people have been dunking on Stan Druckenmiller for saying that Janet Yellen should have termed out uh, their debt in 2021. It's kind of, Stan was probably simplifying to make the point. It's not that they didn't term out the debt. They didn't issue. There was $1.9 trillion in their checking account at the Fed, the so-called Treasury General account. And Janet Yellen, from the moment she got in that seat, announced she was going to drain that account. From February to September, it went from $1.7 trillion to $50 billion. And she did that by not issuing much securities at all. So that $1.7 trillion flooded the banking system filled with you know, full of reserves. At the same time, the Fed was buying some $1.5 trillion worth of securities. That's the real story of 2021 is it's not that she could have issued longer term security. She just didn't issue, period. So yeah. 
Anyway, move forward to today. Um, in early August, they announced they had an extra five hundred billion for sale in the second half of twenty twenty three, and the market started to move immediately. So there was a big mm. move between then and the end of August. We then got a fairly weak August payroll report, which most Fed watchers, myself included, assumed that the Fed would have a fairly dovish forecast in that September SEP summary of economic projections. Of course, they didn't. They actually projected that they were going to keep the policy rate above 5% for the next 15 months. Well, that creates an, a, a, just a huge problem for financing, which relates to what they did last week. And as much as the banking system can't buy treasuries if the deposit rate is above the rate where they can reinvest into treasuries. Remember, banks have 10 turns of leverage too. So um, right. banks finance the belly of the treasury curve. What the treasury did last week was to reduce the pace of increases of issuance in the back end of the market. So 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to try and stabilize the back end. They went over their recommended allocation for treasury bills. It's supposed to be 15 to 20 percent of total issuance or bills, according to the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, private sector bond kings, you know, advising the Fed. They went above that, which I think is going to be a problem. Um, but then they also increased issuance in the belly of the curve. Now, that did cause the back end of the bond market to temporary sta temporarily stabilize. And even today's 10 year auction went OK. We've got a 30 tomorrow. But yeah. the problem is. The main financer for the belly of the curve are the banks. And so mm. the banking system, until they can see uh, or have visibility to cuts in those financing rates, deposit rates, they really can't participate and help finance that part of the curve. So the weeks actually when the bond market has performed worse is not when the Fed's selling 10s and 20s and 30s. It's actually when they've been selling twos through sevens, the belly of the curve, because mm. the banking system isn't there, particularly for fives. And that's a big part of the issuance. And that's when the markets really struggled. So for me, what they did last week was a Band-Aid, caused the short, short covering rally, but they still have this big problem with the banking system not being there to help finance. And just to step back for a second, remember the, the Treasury's three biggest buyers were the Fed? Well, not anymore, right? They're doing QT, mm -hmm. not QE. The banking system's number two, and then foreigners number three, Asian central banks in particular, and they're not there either. Import growth is really slow. Um, <clears throat> their currencies are weak. So if anything, they're more sellers of treasuries than buyers. So we're still in a very precarious situation where we have way more issuance than we ever had before, and we've got a banking system that can't support it. What about in, 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 in the lack of demand, which you've just highlighted? That's right. Okay, so uh, Peter Bookvar in his letter this, earlier this week called the three-year auction meh, like not right. great, not not bad. Uh, you just said the 10-year auction, which I think as we're recording Wednesday has wrapped up, and it sounds like you basically have the, the same description of the 10-year. Uh, before this airs Friday morning, we will have the 30 year auction on on Thursday. Do you think this could be is this going to be the canary in the coal mine this week this 30 year? I I I don't I, and that's that's where I'm, I'm I'm really trying to draw the line. I mean, I I think the 30 will probably not go well. Um but it, again, I think the real problem is the 5 year part of the curve. That's really where banks can't play. So interestingly, you know, this is getting a little bit in the weeds. Twos, you know, a week ago, twos went fine. Well, Stan Druckenmiller's long them. Every, right. you know, a lot of people listened and said, yeah, that's a great idea. If Stan the man's buying them, I'll buy twos too. I've actually been recommending twos because I do think the economy's going to weaken and the two-year note could rally, you know, to four and three quarters, at least four and a half. So the two-year part of the curve is okay. Five-year part of the curve is where banks participate. That's not okay. That was the worst auction the last round when they did that belly, and it was weak the one before that as well. The seven-year auction went okay, and I, I presume part of that had to do with 
There's monstrous basis trading positions right now in the hedge fund community. The duration of a 10-year note future is roughly seven. Uh, or that's, you know, when when you um when you're just hedging against those futures, a newly issued one, you and, and hedging mortgages, you'd probably use seven. So that seven year went okay. That's partially because people wanted to be in the most liquid security. So that's a little in the weeds. But for me, sure. the five year piece is really the the one to watch. Um Barry, listen, you know, this podcast, we have this very niche thing. We we work on metals and miners, but we, we try to get a better understanding of the bigger pictures. And obviously, I am no bond market expert. Uh, and so we depend on people like you to kind of explain this stuff to us uh, like I'm in junior high. And so, uh, you know, and so for people out there who I mean, I mean, I think this is a wealth of information where, and we're, you know, we can say we don't want to get into the weeds, but here's what's on the cover of what's happening Who's who ha have been buyers in the past but are not there now? That is, obviously has major implications, not just on the equity markets, but you know what? What is that? You know those dark clouds in front of this ship that are are we approaching that storm? And what does that storm look like for twenty twenty four? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, one one simplified way to think about all this, and and I realize I did get pretty in the weeds. <laughs> is that the most important price in the global capital market system is the 10-year note treasury. And so when you have instability in that price, and you could look at the Bloomberg liquidity index, you could look at the spread of mortgage-backed securities to 10-year treasuries. When you have instability in that core critical price, it's hard to envision how riskier assets, equities, commodities, any of those things are going to be stable, right? And um, and trade at reasonably rich valuations. And so, you know, we have a huge, for the, basically we have debt to GDP at levels we last achieved in World War II when we had an explicit interest rate cap, an agreement between the Treasury and the Fed, they would not allow interest rates to go above two and a half percent. We don't have that today. So. Um, as we move into the 24 election year, the question is going to be, is there really any interest in stabilizing that debt? And the two leading candidates don't seem to have much interest in it. So um, it, it's hard to imagine that this problem just resolves itself. There is one way to stabilize it for a time, which is, as I've been intimating, which is the Fed cuts interest rates. I, my expectation is they will cut by a percent next year. Oh. Two-year notes at 4%, you know, deposit rates at four and a quarter, that I don't think that 10-year note is going to rally all the way back to three, as people like Jeff Conlack have, have suggested. I think at that point, the curve is upward sloping, and the banking system then, remember how banks work, right? They just, most little banks out there just take in deposits, borrow short, lend long, and they can earn their way out of the 30% of their securities that are held or assets that are held in securities that are losers. Um, they're not going to default, but they're losers, right? They, they're losing money on those assets. And then the other 20% in commercial real estate that much of which will need to be refinanced. And so you really do need the Fed to cut rates. The Fed and Treasury caused this problem and they can resolve it but they're going to need to resolve it by cutting rates. And if the Fed continues to be haunted by the ghost of Arthur Burns and believe that that's the reason why we had intractable inflation in the 70s, which is not what happened. In fact, it was fiscal policy expansion that began in 1965 with LBJ's Great Society and then continued until, you know, through Nixon for sure. And really till uh, Reagan was elected and Volcker came, you know, Volcker did his monetary thing, but it was really fiscal policy that stabilized ultimately that got inflation under control. So if the Fed is hell bent on that and doesn't cut rates in the first half of 2024, they get to the second half, then it becomes highly political, right? So right. my suspicion is the first rate cut comes in March. And if that mm. happens, then the 24 outlook need not be that bad. Um, we've got potentially a big capital spending boom. 
Uh, I think we're, we're going to have a very strong cycle for productivity, technology, innovation, adoption for the delivery of consumer goods, services, healthcare, uh, financial services, the industrial sector, um, you know, rebuilding of our capital stock. All those things are potential secular positives. Um, but, you know, we need to get out of this unstable equilibrium, this deeply inverted yield curve. And one final point on the yield curve, which I think is really important for your listeners, because you hear this on, you know, CNBC, Bloomberg, whatever, all day long, which is the yield curve, the recession indicator is not working this time. Just step back a little bit and, and, and remember that a yield curve can forecast a recession and it has a great record for doing that, you know, like eight no, but that's beyond that because a deeply inverted yield curve, we've only had a yield curve as deeply inverted as the three month bill 10 year note was this go around three other times in our history, 1973, late 79 and late 80. The 79 and 80 episodes in particular led to the demise of the savings and loan industry, which was 80% of the supply of mortgage credit at that point. So, and the 73 deep inversion was, of course, caused by a very deep recession. So this was a really, wasn't unique, right? But right. the precedents, the three precedents were, were pretty ugly. And um, it's just not workable for small and medium banks. I mean, what you haven't chatted about is the prospects of recession. And just from what I'm hearing from you right now, Barry, if you if you project a rate cut in by you know March 2024, would you do you project a deep recession in the first quarter leading to that rate cut? I'm I'm going to frame it a little bit differently because I I think it's important um, to to categorize it in, in in this following way, which is I've been describing the situation as an unstable equilibrium. So at the mm. conference you and I were at, the chart I presented, which I think illustrates this pretty well, is if you look at the duration of the mortgage-backed securities index, it's never been longer. That's just a way of saying most households termed out their mortgage debt. Their effective mortgage rate is 3.6, even though the 30-year fixed rate mortgage index is 7.6 right now, or was in the latest week. So they weren't particularly sensitive to the rate hikes, the, the baseline household. The same is true for large non-financial sector corporates, right? All the companies in the S&P 500, or most of them at least. Again, you know, seven plus year duration on their on that investment grade credit index. Didn't have any immediate needs to refinance, not particularly sensitive to the rate hikes. But then you take the banking system, which I've been describing, the deeply inverted yield curve is an existential threat. It just makes their entire banking model unprofitable. That's how small business gets financed. Small business gets financed through floating rate commercial and industrial loans. Those are now falling at a 3.5% annualized rate because banks aren't giving them out. And right. the rate moved immediately, right? So you got to figure everybody's rate has gone up at least 5%, and that's going to challenge a lot of business models. Then you have this whole multifamily real estate. There's more than a million projects under construction against new starts of only 360,000. We've never had that biggest spread ever. So we have that pig to get pushed through the Python. And then the banking system financing the government debt, which has never been higher. So we have parts of the economy that are eminently unstable. And the small business sector in particular is what we get the least information about with respect to the labor market. There's been, you know, a lot, a lot of ink spilled about the so-called birth death model that the BLS uses to try and estimate small business employment. They take new business creation. They don't really know about new business death for a year and a quarter till after they get IRS documents and find out. And there's a very good chance that um, employment was overstated by 1.3 million jobs in 2022 and maybe <laughs> an even bigger number in 2023. There's other late, you know, small business labor surveys that are weakening. So we may find that the economy has been much weaker. And again, for me, exhibit number one to this is the fact that wages have been falling sharply. And the sectors that Chairman Powell a year ago said, 
he was worried about, you know, non housing services, those wages have been falling most sharply at all as uh, of all. So, you know, education and healthcare, healthcare, for example, strongest employment, but wages have fallen all the way to 3.4% annualized down about 3% from where they were a year ago. So that wage growth is, is weakening. It's weakening for leisure and hospitality. It's weakening for all those service sectors. A lot of small businesses out there, you know, in those sectors and Chances are um, the labor market is just much weaker than we think, not to mention the fact that, you know, there's the theory of revisions, right? So you can take the rate of change of revisions and we've had negative revisions to non-farm payrolls oh. nine of 10 months. The only month that was positive was all government jobs. You read Book Bar, he pointed that out. I, you know, Peter's right. a, a good dude. I know him pretty well. Um, again, all those things point to underlying weakness. But again, the household sector, you know, people always look and say, well, consumption's fine, you know, and American Express's results were okay. You're looking for recession in all the wrong places if you keep looking at household consumption. It's really going to be the labor market through small business where, you know, the foundation is crumbling because of this lack of availability of credit and much higher cost of credit. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think uh, Brent Donnelly posted something on Twitter that was fed to me from Jared Dillian. But I mean, he put a list of all the uh, the revisions that he's seen in the last month from non-farm payrolls to unemployment rate to ISM. New, I think all the, those little data points that, you know, a lot of yep. the macro guys like to go through with a fine tooth comb. I mean, all this and maybe uh, 20 of those categories five of them beat in the revisions, everything was a complete miss. Right. And so you get these data points. I mean, Barry, it's like, should we even be paying attention to these surveys anymore, knowing that in the following month, it's just like going to be thrown out the window? Yeah. Response rates have, have collapsed since the pandemic. You know, the, the jolts report might be the best example that the job openings piece of it gets a 30% response rate. And so, you know, you've just seen some crazy stuff in those job openings. Businesses with one to 49 employees, uh, the openings fell by 1.1 million jobs in the first seven months of the year and then suddenly rebounded 600,000 in the last two months. <laughs> really? You know, like what happened? Small businesses just said, like August, yeah, things are great. And let's advertise for new data. No, I mean, the data looks really dubious. And so, you know, and, and it, it's some of it's just, common sense. I mean, you shock rates this much higher in this short a period of time to think that there's no macroeconomic impact in the sectors that are um, vulnerable, like small business and the banking system is just um, wishful thinking. So, yeah. uh, you know, need we have a hard landing? You know, not necessarily. Again, that household sector is really big and really important yeah. and spent 15 years reducing or deleveraging, reducing their amount of household debt and has a lot of equity, you know, has a favorable wealth effect. I think people get carried away with the impact on of wealth effects. Um, they're not that great. I mean, the landmark studies on this case Schiller, you know, it's three to 4% over two years, right? So created, you know, the, all the stock market decline of last year 27% decline I estimated was worth 70 basis points off nominal GDP. Just, and we were growing, nominal GDP was growing eight at that point. So it just wasn't a big deal. Um, but there's certain sectors that have been destabilized. And that's really what I'm, I'm worried about. And the Fed, because, again, because they're opaque, we don't get good data on it. Low response rates. We're just going to wake up one day and go, wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. The, Situation's worse than we thought. And then the Fed will be cutting no matter what they think they're going to do, in which case, you know, the, the, the question is, um, does do those other sectors, you know, multifamily, real estate, banking system, small business, is it systemic? Does it cause a deep recession or not? And it just depends on how stubborn the Fed is about all this. Um, right. Let me... Uh turn the page and I do, I do want to ask you about gold and precious metals and part of that conversation back in Beaver Creek was more or less you know it wasn't a, you know 
in favor or in distant favor of precious metals. But really, a lot of the the discussion was focused on appropriate allocation to gold in a portfolio. And I got the sense that, you know, there's a lot of people that manage a lot of money in that room that have a much you know broader scope of the macro environment than than I certainly do. But it seemed like a lot of those individuals were willing to say, at a time like this, maybe the allocation to gold should be more than that 5% historic norm that a lot of people have heard. So I just wanted to pose that question to you about your your thoughts on precious metals within a portfolio. And if we've reached a point where there's so much chaos and unstable equilibriums, as you pointed out, that does that allocation to precious metals – need to increase yeah i mean I, I i started down this path a little bit earlier which is thinking about what actually happened in the 60s and 70s and um i'm a huge student of um you know the central bank central banking mm -hmm. money over time <clears throat> bill martin who was the chairman of the fed from early 1951 through 1970 is, I, I, I love his quote that the Fed is independent within, not of the government, right? So unless you think there's a viable path to stabilizing the U.S. debt, um, there is really only one way out. There was an excellent paper. One of the authors was a guy named Lawrence Ball, who also wrote The Fed in Lehman Brothers. It was a great book. I was a 19-year Lehman Brothers guy. I worked with Jared Dillian uh, at, at Lehman Brothers. But anyway, the paper's premise was Larry Summers, Olivier Blanchard are promoting this idea that if R is less than G, G meaning the real interest rate is rest less than the real growth rate, you can grow your way out of debt. And that's exhibit A is the World War II debt. But this paper shows that that's really not what actually happened. That was about half of the decline in debt. The other half was attributable to unexpected inflation resulting from financial repression. And the other half was running a primary surplus, meaning before interest payments, you know, you took in more than you um, paid out, the federal government did. Well, the CBO projects, you know, six to 7% deficits for the entire 10 year time horizon, we're at 24 to 25% of GDP for spending. We've never, we've only gotten to 19% receipts as a percent of GDP twice, 2001 stock market boom and bubble. And then again in 2022 stock market boom and bubble. So we're on a path where the only way out for the U S is, is inflation playing a major contributing factor to trying to, deflate their way out or inflate their way out of the debt, which means the public bears the cost. So yeah. um, are they any better off in Europe, China, Japan, right? So, you know, when you look at exchange rates, so the question is relative to what, right? And um, we all know the historic gold story. Uh, you know, I've got a small allocation to Bitcoin for the same, on the same thesis, and I, I believe that, first of all, inflation, when you think about inflation over the last 20 years, and I'm, I know I'm putting it in the context of inflation, but there's a broader instability argument as well that I made a little sure. bit earlier. But within the context of inflation, the only reason we had two-ish percent inflation from 2002 to 2020 was because of China, the integration of China and the Soviet bloc into global supply chains and having zero goods inflation for 20 years. Services inflation ran at two and three quarters, three. Housing inflation ran at three. So, you know, if you think about those being influenced by policy, both fiscal and monetary, they're not likely to even run at three. They're likely to run at something greater than three. Let's just call it three half. And then goods inflation, we're not getting a big giant other, you know, labor supply shock, unless all of a sudden manufacturing moves to Africa or something. So, you know, we're going to have higher trend inflation in goods as well, in which case in that environment with that unsustainable debt, I, it just seems to me that some anchor assets 
with more stability to them, like gold, maybe Bitcoin. You know, I realize it's still yeah. controversial, speculative, but it's an interesting theory. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I just think we're going to be in an environment that are going to be more conducive to hard assets in general. So. Uh, Barry, I really appreciate your time. I know we, we were able to get this done pretty quickly. Uh, you were traveling this week and I reached out and you're like, how about today, Trev? I was like, sure, Barry, I'd be happy to do that today. But yep. I appreciate I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, no, I was happy to. And um, again, you, you you pointed it out. Your, um, uh, any of your listeners can find me on um, ironsizemacro.substack.com. I've got a pretty extensive macro uh, report I put out every week, 2,500 to 3,000 words. Be a pre free preview of it. I do an audio summary of it as well. More extensive one, you know, roughly 12 to 14 minutes or so for the people that pay for the full subscription and then a preview note of five or six minutes for those who just want to get the, the free stuff. So <laughs> anyway, find, find me there and then, you know, look for me on uh, on TV. I've got Squawk Box scheduled next Tuesday and then Fox Business on Friday. So um, you'll, you'll see me on the air as well. Well, I, I look forward I look forward to that. And I'll put a link uh, to the Substack in the show notes, too, so people can just click on that and, and awesome. go visit. Uh, Barry, have a happy rest of your week, and we'll touch base. Uh, hopefully we'll see you up there on the hill when the snow falls. Awesome. Thanks, Trevor. All right, everybody, uh, here's a guest that has been long overdue to get him back onto Mining Stock Daily, Michael Oliver from Momentum Structural Analysis, uh, the godfather of Momentum Analysis. Mike, welcome back. It's been far too long. I'm glad to be back, Trevor. Hey, uh, so we're going to we're gonna kind of kind of wade through the weeds here a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about precious metals, industrial metals, the miners, all those things in due time. But because it's been a little while since we've had you on the podcast, since we last spoke, we've had a huge shift in the bond market. We've had a waning equity market in despite, you know, as we record Wednesday, things are, are kind of had bounce, but uh, you could maybe, maybe make the case that momentum is waning at this stage. And I'm sure you've got some thoughts on that. Uh, and then we have a Federal Reserve that is continues to be, quote, unquote, data dependent. Um, so I thought I'd ask you first off, you know, if we look back in 2023, what's something that has surprised you and what's something that has not surprised you? Uh, not a lot of surprises, actually. Uh, it's a slow. I think the context that gold investors need to really keep in the front of their windshield instead of the ticker by ticker of, you know, what this mining stock's doing and so forth. We have the biggest stock market bubble in U.S. stock market history. It's broken. We got bearish in January and February of 2022, long-term bearish or NASDAQ 100 and S&P, and they've not seen those price levels since. So if you got out then, you'd miss nothing. Now, admittedly, after the first wave of drop, that we had in the S&P, which went from like 4,800 down to 3,500, we had a big recovery. Couldn't get back to the highs, but now we're, we're raid, waiting around 4,300 area. Okay. The bubble, as far as we're concerned, technically speaking, is broken. And you got to take the, into context, what other stock market bubbles have we had in U.S. history? 1923 to 1929, okay? We, uh, I think it was about a triple Dow Jones. Uh, in the mid 70s, uh, we made a peak, crashed into 74, but that bull market, it's like a triple or so. Then the dot com bubble was a double to a triple, depending on what, what index you looked at. And then the real estate peak in 2007, measured from the 2002 low, was about a double for the SP 500. So, despite the fact that they were doubles or triples in terms of the dimensionality of the bull bubble, when they broke, there was all kinds of devastation in the real world, not just among stock market investors. Mm -hmm. And each time the Fed responded the same way, they went back to print, print, print. This time the bubble is so huge, it's a sevenfold bubble in the S&P, 
from 2009 low to 2021, 16-fold in NASDAQ 100. And if you think that's due to uh, good economic metrics, look at an M2 chart and look at the Fed funds rate chart. Both of them will easily explain why we had a paper asset bubble. And when they stopped with the printing or slowed it down, the bubble broke. Okay. Now, the problem is every time the bubble breaks in the past, the central bank will come in usually early in the bear trend. Mm -hmm. For example, in fact, in, in, in 2007, the Fed actually, after a couple of years of rate rises through 2006, cut rates in September of 2007. Two weeks later, the S&P made its final high. In other words, they had a joyous final rally because the Fed actually didn't pause. They cut rates. Did that help the market? No, market crashed anyway. Okay, and they cut rates all the way down. Go back to the 2000.com top. They cut rates in January of 2001. That's about when the market really started to roll over. And as the market rolled over hard, they cut the rates all the way down. It didn't help the market. The bubble was broken. Okay. The difference this time is we have the biggest paper asset bubble in U.S. history. And the consequences are likely to be far greater than any of the other broken bubbles. Not only the dimensionality of the bubble, but the age of the bubble. A dozen years of upside. None of those bull markets spanned a dozen years. They spanned a handful. Okay. So... During that period of time, if you're a family, a corporation, municipal government, the federal government, whatever, you based certain economic decisions you made on various factors. One of those key factors is the price of money. So if you were deluded into believing that money's going to stay free forever, and it seemed to, then you made great mistakes. And when they pulled the needle out of your arm, early last year when they started raising rates. The hallucinogens that were no one coming in anymore. And all of a sudden reality hits you. And those domino effects of those errors that were made over that span of years will start to pop up and expose themselves in the data points. They'll be lagged to the market, but the data points will come and the Fed will respond to them. Now, you say, what happened recently that might have surprised us a bit? Well, it didn't really surprise us, but the bond market crashed. And I'm not talking high yield corporate debt. I'm talking government, U.S. government debt market crashed. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at a chart of uh, TLT, which is the ETF of 20 year plus maturity U.S. bonds, or look at T-bond futures. And starting last summer, as they went down, they started the gap down almost like a commodity, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and there's no question in my mind that that set a panic in the minds of the Treasury Department and the Fed. Now, they may not state it in their public statements, but you know darn good and well that when their market is in crash mode, they had to respond. And I think they have in the sense that they're probably buying bonds in the dark to help support that market. So they're printing. And a lot of large asset managers also are shifting now back into the T-bond market, perceiving it to be washed out, oversold, and maybe once again, an alternative to a questionable stock market. So that's one event this year that was a surprise to many, namely a bond market, a U.S. debt market crash. I think it's over. We thought it, we we predefined it as a nuke event, and it turned out to be a nuclear type event. It wasn't reflected in the stock market. It was to a lesser extent reflected in other bond markets, but especially the long-term U.S. Treasury market, which is the most important market for the Treasury and for the Fed in terms of policy direction. They cannot let that market do what it did. And I do think they intervened. And I think that helped V-bottom it. And I think we're in a V-bottom situation now in T-bonds. Now, meaning drop in yields. Don't confuse that with the long-term trend, though. The long-term trend of T-bonds, whether you look at a yield chart or you look at the price chart of the 30-year uh, bonds and run momentum studies, is fully broken on a long-term basis. What we're getting now, I think, is simply a counter-trend rally that will curl hair and kill late shorts, the guys who got bearish late and didn't get out right. Uh, that happens often in markets. But I think it's also the beginning of a softening by the Fed. So our view is, no, there's no more rate hikes, period. Scratch it. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. You can sit and listen like a child in front of the school teacher for Powell's comments to try to interpret whether he's going to raise or not. He's not going to. They can't jeopardize that bond market again. They have to defend that beast. And in so doing, they're going to have to print money. Now, the other problem is going to be when the stock market rolls over. And I think it's begun to roll over, despite the recent rally of the last few weeks. I think the process of the, the recovery that we saw from the lows of last October through the summer highs this year, I think that recovery process, which was a counter trend rally in our view, in other words, yeah, a nice rally, but it was intermediate. It wasn't long term. The long term trend is fractured. We think it's going to roll over again. And if I were watching the stock market right now, I would, I think I'd toss the S&P and the NASDAQ out the window. Mm. And everybody knows why. There's about five stocks, especially three, that constitute the overwhelming weighting of those indices, such that if anybody that calls them the broad indices is totally wrong. Apple and Microsoft are so dominant in the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P that they totally distort the picture. Uh, in fact, if you just on your quote screen, flip up a lot of sector ETFs like XLF, for example, financial sector. Uh, it's in the lower quarter of its price range of the last several years, while the S&P is sort of been slightly above the halfway mark right. because of Apple and Microsoft. Or look at XLY, that's consumer discretionary. That's a, what's considered a risk on sector. It's a sector that all during the bull market, the 11, 12 year bull market, outperformed the S&P, as it should have, because it, it contains stocks like Amazon and a lot of uh, retail companies and so forth, consumer discretionary, in other words, risk on sector. It's broken. Mm -hmm. And it's relative performance to the S&P, if you plot that as a chart, a spread chart, you can see it's destroyed its entire uptrend. And if you look at XLY's price and compare it to the price of the S&P, you say, what? This is a leader index? And it's, it's in the it's in the lower third of its price range in the last two years. So don't look at S&P. I would watch banks and I'd watch XLF as the prime sectors. Those are the sectors that most concern the central bank. They don't care about NVIDIA. They care about the banks. Look at a Citicorp chart. Look at a Bank of America chart. They're like in a different universe than the S&P 500. In fact, the last few days, if you look at the S&P, so far this week, it's up, oh, half a percent, okay? Two, three days of upside. Banks are down over 2% in the same time. So that's what you need to watch if you're watching gold and you're looking for the rationale for why is it back at its highs again? Why is it back to 2000 again over this three-year period? It keeps coming back to its highs because it knows what's about to happen. It knows the bubble is broken. And the central bank has to respond ultimately in an aggressive way. Uh, Mike, let's, I, I want to pause it because there's, I mean, so many different ideas that in the back okay. of my head that I think we can take this. I, I think it's important to note, you and I are chatting Wednesday morning. I don't know how many of tens of billions of dollars of 10 year notes is hitting supply today and, uh, and being auctioned. So obviously we have this, continued conversation about the dynamic of supply and demand in the bond market of all things. And that has just been a conversation that's been going on for months right now. And just curious, like, how are you seeing this, uh, this just gargantuan addition of supply and government, government bonds hitting the market? How is that kind of helping frame your thesis here of where that bond market actually goes on top of you seem pretty adamant that you believe that the central bank is somehow buying 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 bonds and keeping this thing as elevated as possible yeah uh one i'm not a bond expert okay i'm not an either am i either okay. am i so. <laughs> but i i can analyze things broadly and again we have the biggest broken paper asset bubble in the in in u.s history in fact more so than any market in the world you look at the European stock markets or look at China, they don't have a bubble. They're, they're, they're weak. China's sitting at the precipice of a next leg down. And we know they have a real estate problem, but they don't have a stock market bubble. They're trading right now about double where they were in 2009. We're trading, you know, six, seven times where we were in 2009 in the S&P. So it's a big difference there. So likely we're going to have worse consequences in terms of 
the paper asset bubble breaking and causing data points to change. And I just know over history, it's a constant repetition, a pattern of the boom bust cycle is a monetary event. It is not a market event. The monetary event creates paper asset events. And when they break, the monetary flow starts again in all different ways that they can do it, including buying T-bonds in the dark, which I'm sure they did at the trading desk. Uh, that is a problem that is unsolvable for them, frankly. And I kind of agree with, well, I kind of, I totally agree with some analysts out there who think that we're headed for a global government debt market crisis, not just us, but Japan, Europe, and so forth. It's not just U.S. And so if you ever jeopardize or create doubt about the viability of a debt instrument from the government, so you as a potential buyer of the bond have questions whether you should be doing that or buying gold instead or sitting on cash. That is a crisis for governments. And they, they frankly have only one, alter one way to solve that, and that's to print, print, print to support those markets. And as we know in Japan, it hasn't worked anyway. So I think we have a global, especially developed economy, bond crisis coming. And we've only just seen the beginning of it. In other words, the rise in yields, which broke out over trends that go back 40 years. Now we're getting a dip in yields, fine, but that's a dip against the new trend, which is upside. And when the government debt market gets into question, everything gets thrown up in the air. Right. That's the last, that's the last line in the sand, ain't it? Because it, for, for something, for an asset that's been perceived as the safest investment in the history of financial markets, uh, you know, and I questioned this myself as like, it that risk profile has gone from safest to there's got to be a little bit more perceived risk in there at this Absolutely. moment in time. Absolutely. Right? No question. And and again, watch the banks, especially the big, the two big to fails. Uh, we run momentum studies on them and frankly, they look ugly as hell. Okay. Mm. Just look at a price chart of Bank of America and Citicorp. Two, two I would pick out to watch. They made new multi-year lows. Okay. Now, in fact, Citicorp, if you go back and plot its monthly closing prices going back to 2016, so it's seven years, eight years, so seven years, okay. There's only one close that was lower than last month's close, and that was in early 2016. And if you eliminate it and go further back to 2012, the close last month in Citicorp was the lowest monthly price close since 2000, late 2011. Mm. Okay. Now, so the, any concern about regional banks is out the window. The point now are the too big to fails. And the Fed cannot allow anything to happen there, anything to be talked about there. Because once investors perceive that, my goodness, the too big to fails are having problems. And we know Citicorp is doing something drastic because the CEO is cutting in, you know, massive layoffs. Why? I thought everything was rosy. You know, okay. So anyway, watch those bank stocks because I don't care what Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft are doing. The Fed cares about those stocks. And if they continue to slide and ooze through multi-year lows, the Fed has to pay attention to that just as they do with their own bond market crashing. And that's what will dictate monetary policy. Mike, let's talk about precious metals here. You, you had mentioned previously in the conversation that gold investors need to be paying very close attention, but you didn't, you weren't very specific on what we need to be paying attention to. So maybe let's open this up and talk about, we've had a massive move trying to once again, go through that $2,000 per ounce mark and, and settle there coming back around 1965, which is again, a line that I've had on my gold chart for God knows forever. Um, you know, talk about the momentum we saw and kind of maybe what we've seen in the last couple of weeks coming down from that high. Okay. What's interesting about the T-bonds and gold is that mm -hmm. since early this year, both markets recovered from a low last October. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gold made a low then at 1613. We call that a bear trap low, meaning you gold dropped through a prior price floor that anybody with a crayon and a chart could draw. And that was at 1675. So between late 2020 and 
summer of 2022, there were repeated drops to 1675. When you broke that, everybody said gold's going to hell, going to 1400, going to 1200, et cetera, et cetera. We said it would be a bear trap. It went down to September, October, and V bottomed out of there. Next thing you know, we're back at 2050 plus. Yes. You know, that's gold. Where did it make its high in 2020? Just above 2050. Where did it make its March 2022 high? Above 2050. Where did it make its high early this year? Above 2050. Okay. Then you had another drop that started early this year. Now, if you look at a bond chart, you'll see that it also started back down. The difference being that while it was in sync with gold, price going down in bonds, yields going up, and gold coming down, gold had an arm wrestling match. It was sort of redundant. It wasn't a collapse. And it certainly didn't go back to last October's lows. Bonds went down and took out last October's lows. But they were in total time sync week by week with gold. Then came a divorce. And that's when gold turned up and we got bullish at 1862, coming up off the 1826 low, I think it was uh, in last month. And between last month's low and last month's high, gold rallied $196. It broke out over what we defined as monthly momentum trend structures. You couldn't see it on a price chart until much later in the rally. But momentum broke out at 1862 and 1928 and it blew its cork. And once again, gold's back over 2,000 again. It's the fourth time in three years. Something's going on there. How come it keeps going back to its high? Okay, And it did it so suddenly. Literally in 16 trading days, gold went up $196. Now everybody's impressed with the downside, but nobody seems impressed with the upside that just occurred. That was very dramatic. It was a statement. Okay. The current downside... Uh, by the way, and then the T-bonds, a couple of weeks after gold V-bottomed, finally did the same. But they lagged the gold upturn. It was like two to three weeks later. Then suddenly, the T-bonds started the rocket out of their hole and are still, still doing so. So that synchronization sort of broke down a bit there. But they were in sync very nicely up to that point. And now T-bonds are sort of echoing what gold said in October, like, I'm coming out of here. Okay. The difference is T-bonds won't sustain ultimately. I think gold will. Now, gold, obviously, in that nearly $200 surge, got overbought on a near-term basis. I mean, if you're a technician and you look at fairly short-term indicators, you say, oh, it's overbought. Well, fine, it's overbought. I understand that. You went up 200 bucks in 16 trading days. Uh, so we've had now four weeks of constant selling on short-term momentum. I can, I can, you can see it on our oscillators. Cooling the market off. The last I saw gold, I don't know where it is right now, was in the 1960s, okay? So we're a couple percent off the recent high, but we're still $140 above the October low. And it took us a whole month of zigzagging arm wrestling decline to get down into the 18, 1960s, whereas it took us 16 days to go up to $100. Contrast that, you know. I think the recent downside of gold is a minor pause in the upside. We're also watching the miners and silver. Yeah. Now, we all know, anybody who's in those markets knows, oh, golly, these guys are dogs. They're always lagged to gold. They're not. Sometimes they are. Quite a few times they're lagged to gold, and they seem to underperform. But there are times when you go back over 20 or 50 years of history in the gold miners and silver in relation to gold, where they suddenly get into gear and beat the pants off of gold in terms of percent gain over a short-term period of time. Uh we think we're on the edge of that situation now. And if I threw out a number for you using GDX, which is the gold and it also includes some silver miners, the ETF. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think you're trading around 28. You get back up around the mid 29s again, watch out. Yeah. It's probably going to blow a cork. Now the price chart guys will get excited if you get above 30 because there's some repeated highs recently that got up above 30. But um, we're saying if you get up to the mid 29s again, Anytime in the next week or two, watch out. You could get a very sharp explosion. And as far as silver goes, right now it's it's broken out via some metrics like monthly momentum. But there's a 200-day average momentum study we did of silver, and sure enough, the 200-day crowd has been selling the 200-day average for the last several sure. weeks. Sure. You close a day out at 23.29. 
no, excuse me, 23, 39. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're going to blow those guys out. So now that's, we've gotten up to 2388 in the recent rally. So you get back up into the low 23s again, and we think silver is likely to add a couple bucks very quickly. So we're watching for the miners in silver to do a sudden catch up to what gold just did in late October. Okay. And I think that's at hand. You know, they're talking about the GDX, and I mean, this is something that I question the barometer of the GDX. I mean, I understand the significance of that ETF. And you're right. Like once once that that price goes up to about $29, $30, there is resistance, a heavy resistance level there. And just right above that is also that 200 day moving average. Um, so yeah, uh -huh. I, I think I think you're spot on. If you can no, get a wait, there's, a big, that. there's a big difference though. Wait, silver has resistance at the 200 day, but if you do GDX, it has a quadruple top at $1 yes. below the 200 day. So if you ever get and close a day, and this is why I gave you that 2940 number. Mm -hmm. You ever close a day there, I'm going to blow through its 200 day momentum structure, not the 200 day average, because that's not where the resistance is. It's at one point below. You've hit it four times since August. So when you look at a momentum chart, you see something you don't see on the price chart. And that is a ceiling that is so clear that if you ever break through it, you know, you're going to pop a cork. And it says 200 day momentum says 2940, you're gone. Right, so that's what so, I'd be watching for. Well, Mike, the re the reason I question sometimes the barometer using GDX in the gold mining sector is because of the heaviest weighted position in that ETF is Newmont, mm -hmm. and Newmont is mm -hmm. just so beaten up. I mean, I they've closed this acquisition with Newcrest, and and I guess I could expect why investors would be selling that off because of you know, how much capital intensity it's going to, it took to get mm -hmm, that deal mm -hmm. done. And, and with this acquisition, all that, mm -hmm. I mean, it's still nine and a half percent of the GDX and that That's chart looks like absolute shit. Yeah. So, yeah. So is it fair to, to continue to use uh, the GDX? Well, that's this? why we look at, we also watch XAU, which has more silver miners in it than does GDX. GDX is only like a half a dozen and XAU has been around since what the 1970s. So it's much older index of gold and silver miners. And we also watch SIL, which is the silver miner ETF. So we're watching all three. Now, all three have broken out on what we call monthly momentum, which is price measured versus uh, three month average. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the 200 day average, which is a longer term metric, that's like three quarters of a year, uh, three quarter average or 200 day, it's fairly long term. They're all sitting there just below this structure. So even though, yes, GDX is heavily weighted, it's sort of, you know, you can complain the same thing about GDX as you do about S&P, you know, Microsoft and Apple, okay, heavily weighted. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Now, but don't give up on Newmont because frankly, even though it looks like a dog compared to its highs that we saw the last year or two, okay? If you go back and look at where it was at the bear market low, it's up about as much as gold is, which is to say a double. So yes, while it's given up a lot of ground from its high, because it beat gold during certain periods of the last eight-year bull trend. And that's, a, that's an important point we're trying to make too recently is the age of this bull market in gold. It's been an incremental trend. A lot of redundant stuff. You know, you go up, you pull back halfway. You go up, you pull back again. You know, it, it seems it, it's, it's unnerving. Okay, because it's not easy money. That's the way most trends are. But if you go back and look at gold and the age of its prior bull trends, again, we have fundamentals now that are far more dynamite than they were in the 1970s to 1980 bull trend or the, 19, um, the 2000 to 2011 bull trend. But those bull trends lasted 10 years, about 10 years each, measured from low to the high. We're already eight years old. So this bull trend has got some age on it. And if you go back and look at those two bull trends, when did they go ballistic? In the last handful of quarters of the bull trend. In other words, you, if you join gold uh, in 1979, and it already missed the move from the early 70s through 1979, which saw gold go from the 30s up to you know, 400 bucks or so. 
most of the money was made in three quarters, starting in, in mid to uh, first quarter of 1979 through the first quarter of uh, 1980. It went ballistic. So the last two bull trends in the last 50 years, most of the money was made in the late part of the trend and consider that we're already eight years old. So it wouldn't shock us that if gold now inches up and finally goes through what we call an idiot level, pardon, the repeated selling above 2000, it finally go through there and wake the price guys up by hitting 2100, let's say. What happens on the other side of that could be totally different to what happened for the prior eight years. So be aware of that. And that's a point where asset managers, and we already know who some of them are because they've already expressed their views. You know, the Gunlocks of the world, the Ray Dalio's, uh, you know, uh, Druck and Miller's, uh, they're, they're kind of skeptical of the stock market and also skeptical of any soft landing notion. Right. And they're friendly toward the notion of something that holds its value. And if you looked at assets, major historic portfolio assets, What's at its all-time high? Not government debt markets, not real estate, not even the bloated S&P and NASDAQ. And certainly not most indices. Of, like you look at uh, uh, small caps or mid caps in the U.S., you, they're, they're living in a different world. They're laying on their lows in the last two years. So and then how come gold is at all-time historic highs again? It's saying something. It knows something. And I think a lot of big asset managers know that. Okay, now, if they finally make a larger commitment and say, okay, I'm going to lighten up my stock portfolio. Now, already they're buying bonds now. They'd be going back to the bond market, which is a traditional component. They're looking at gold miners. And a lot of these portfolio managers won't buy, uh, you know, juniors. Right. They're going to buy the Newmonts of the world, the barracks of the world. So don't be shocked if uh, you see Newmont come up out of that hole. And we measure its momentum as well. So, you know, yes, it looks like heck right now compared to the miners in general or to gold. Yeah. But don't be shocked because uh, that's where the large managers will go. All right. Very, very good point, Mike. I, I want to take this down the food chain a little bit. I do want to ask you about the juniors. Listen, because we are kind of waiting in you know, rough waters here and we we don't know what the future holds. I mean, we can always we can make a very educated um, uh, uh, guesses of, you know, what the data is telling us. And obviously you have this incredibly unique way of kind of putting your thesis out there. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, could we have an environment? And I know a lot of people that invest in the juniors and explorers are going to hate this question, but could we continue to have an environment where gold rises abruptly makes new all-time highs you see investment capital coming into the royalty companies the major producers maybe even the mid-tiers the ones that are actually producing money but the risk profile of explorers is just far too risky when most of the market is risk off that we still are in this drought of capital coming into the explorers is okay. that a possibility no i think they're going to be a good place to be in fact, there's okay. a point at which I think, if, if as I described, if we're late in the gold bull trend, meaning there's only another year or two to go, and it could be the most dynamic part of the entire bull trend, as it was in 1980, as it was in 2010-11, okay, that's when your large gold miners are going to start gobbling up the juniors. Once they perceive, now remember, a lot of people that run mining companies aren't necessarily economists or right certainly not technicians, and they may not know, they may be looking at their own share price and saying, golly, this is, you know, this is dreary and so forth. But as soon as they sense, and this is also true with large portfolio managers who are not gold bugs either, when they sense, hey, it's not as bad as I thought, and suddenly they start to sense the rising wave, not only in gold, but in the miners too. And they see money moving from the stock market into this tiny little sector called gold and silver miners. That's when some of your large mining companies are going to start gobbling, gobbling up these uh, nickel dime 40 cent stocks. And that may be, not be right at the start of the next phase. In other words, if gold goes through 2000, 2000 uh, all those highs and start to excite people. And silver's up, taking out 30, for example. Initially, that might be led by not the juniors, 
but by the miners in general catching up to gold and outpacing gold, which we measure technically, by the way. And there are some structures on the spread between the gold miners and gold that could indicate when the miners are about to outperform gold, which we think will occur in this next phase. But there's some point in that, probably several months into the advance, where suddenly the juniors will get hot. And that could largely be an, an effect of, of individual investors trying to pick bargain situations, but also more so that the large miners sense that, okay, the water's fine. Let's go ahead and commit some resources to buy in these explorers and these junior miners. And all of a sudden these dime stocks go to a dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that could occur. Now that would, uh, I think in my mind, Mike, that would somewhat trigger a, uh, the end of that cycle, you know, trying to take lessons from previous cycles. We've could be, but on the other hand, where are you going to be at the end of that? And maybe, and I'm just a thought here, you don't have a bear market in gold going forward after this next run. Instead, gold is incorporated. It, is, it becomes the currency of the world. We already know there's some major governments on the edge of maybe doing that. Chinese, for example. And there may be others. Once you get into a bond market crisis, there may be some academic and even government heads who say, hey, you know, this paper game hasn't been working. Uh, let's get something stable. Uh, and, and we start to revert to a gold back currency. Uh, and God knows where gold might be. Now I suggest something else. Again, we have a bigger crisis than we've ever had confronting gold in terms of helping get go up. A, a paper bubble that's bigger than any in history. Therefore, more central bank panic. Those two gold bull moves were eightfold moves. 1970s to 1980. 2000 to 2011, eightfold moves in 10 years. Okay, where did we start our bull market? 1,050. Yeah. What's eightfold? Okay, that would, that would merely be replicating these two other bull markets, which didn't have the fire in the belly that this one could have. So when we've suggested you could go to $8,000 gold and maybe $200 silver, that seems ludicrous. But on a, actually on a, on a ratio scale, it's merely replicating what's happened in the past. Right. And we have fundamentals that could drive it even further. So I, I do question, Mike. I mean, obviously, I invest in gold and gold equity equities for many reasons. A lot of them have been brought up in this conversation. And I'm, I'm sure you have thought about this in your career. And as I have thought about it frequently, you know, let's say we let's be conservative with your estimates, not eightfold. Let's say it's fivefold, you know, and we may, we hit $5,000 gold. What does the world look like at $5,000 gold? Uh, you get me off track here. Okay. My background is political philosophy. I'm a libertarian. I've written a book on it and everything. And I, I, I based on Ayn Rand, merging it with Murray Rothbard's economics. Okay. So I'm a libertarian. I have been since the 1970s when the movement started. I was among about 200 people. Okay. So I have a philosophical framework. But let me put it this way. If you've ever read Atlas Shrugged, we're in part three of Atlas Shrugged. So everything comes apart. Meaning when bad ideas create bad institutions and they perpetuate error after error after error and constant boom bust cycles that affect real people in the real world. There's a point at which you could have a crisis that causes a lot of people, including academics, to throw the papers up in the air and say, we got to figure out something else. And I think we're on the borderline now, not just in the US, but elsewhere as well, where a lot of political notions get tossed out the window. And I'm even in Argentina right now, you've got a guy running who is, there's another election coming up to settle this, who's an anarcho-capitalist. Not just a libertarian, an anarcho, he wants to abolish government. And he beat the two major parties, like their Democrat and Republican Party. He beat right. them as running as an independent in all the elections coming up to this. Now they have to have a runoff between him and, and a right-wing guy. Okay. And he may not win, but he's, he's proven that there's a public receptivity to the notion of, hey, you know, government's not working. And Argentina is not some ridiculous third world country you know it was the eighth biggest economy in the world about 20 years ago okay so but we're getting that kind of upheaval and in the u.s i i suggest the following there is no outcome to this next election 
that is quote happy. I agree with I <laughs> wholeheartedly agree with that. There have been academic studies polled taken by reputable institutions of both Republican voters and Democrat voters. And even among Democrats, I forget the stat, it was like 20 to 30% said violence would be justified if Trump wins the election. Whoa. Okay. Now, and if he doesn't win the election, what do you think these red states are going to do? Mm -hmm. Already Texas is talking about having its own gold back currency, which is a rebellion in itself. Okay. There's talk in Texas of secession. Oh, it's under the surface. But it's actually on the ballot, I think, in the 2024 to cause the state legislature to seriously discuss the issue of secession. Whoa. OK, so give me an outcome that's happy two party outcome like they used to be 30, 40 years ago. It's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying this is what it looks like could happen. What does that mean for markets and public perception of normality? And also, therefore, to their sense of the safety of government bonds. Or should I be in the stock market? Maybe I should have my money in gold. Okay. Mm -hmm. These thoughts, even among people who aren't gold bugs, will start to pop up because they sense, once they sense that, oh my gosh, there's a whole new variable here, political instability. Mix that in the soup. Mike, thanks so much for this conversation. Uh, I apologize that it took took me a while to reach back out and we were able to get this done pretty quickly this week. Uh, I always enjoy these chats and I, I, hopefully in 2024, we can do it more often. Um, you know, I'm still waiting to see you in person. You're just up the road on I or I-25 there here in Colorado. Yeah, but yeah. I would <laughs> <love you>. yeah. <laughs> uh, It's good to see you. Thanks so much for this. And, you know, let's uh, remind people where they can find your work and how to reach out to you. Our website is olivermsa.com, MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis. Uh, request some samples to get there. You find my picture, my email is below it. Request some samples, be happy to send them to you. Yeah, uh, it, they are must read, everybody. I highly recommend you take them up on that offer. All right, Mike, have yourself a great week and a happy Thanksgiving. Season's greetings. How about that? Season's Thank greetings. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor.